Hey everyone, last time we had a look at the FX4300, a quad-core CPU from AMD's bulldozer family of processors, infamous for their lack of performance owing to their poorly designed architecture. But today though, we're taking a look at its slightly older but bigger sibling, the 6-core 6100. Launched a year prior to the 4300, the FX6100 would have cost you 165 US dollars at the time, which adjusting for inflation is around 208 dollars today. Although it is considerably cheaper now and can be had for only 12 pounds at CEX here in the UK, or it could have until I bought the last one. Specs wise, it's pretty much identical to the 4300, just with lower clock speeds, 3.3 gigahertz boosting to 3.9 gigahertz in certain circumstances. Slight increases in the amount of cache, and slightly older version of the architecture as well. The six cores of the 6100, like the other FX CPUs, are split into dual core modules, three in this case, with two cores per module. And with the lower clock speed, you might actually see lower performance than the 6100's higher clocked quad core counterparts in applications and games that aren't able to utilise more than four cores. I'll be running it with the same test system and fitting it through the same benchmarks that I did with the FX4300, so you're able to watch the previous video if you'd like to get a comparison of how the two compare. Although with GT5 I've dropped the settings I used last time, but other than that everything else is identical. First up is Cinebench R20, benchmark designed to use all available cores in a processor. And while the technology it's based on isn't that widely used, it is still a popular benchmark to run. And despite the deficit in clock speed compared to the 4300, the FX6100's extra cores help it to pull ahead with a score of 729 points, 15.35% ahead of the 4300, which it does while pulling 84.19 watts plus or minus 3%. This is CPU only power draw and not power drawn from the wall and is also a good representation of the sort of power the 6100 would use under a heavy load. CSGO is first up for the games today, and is being run with the competitive settings found at .esports.com, although I will probably go back to using whatever settings helps CPUs and graphics cards to run best in future videos. That aside, CSGO actually ran reasonably well. It does have the usual heavy hitches in the first round, which seems common on older processors, and slight micro stuttery throughout, along with a very occasional brief hitch as well. It's one of the games that actually performs better on the 4300, at least in benchmark figures, but overall it is still playable. 2016's Doom is next up. Same settings as the FX4300 video, so 1080p with max settings using Vulkan, and with anti-aliasing, depth of field, bloom and lens effects turned off. I've also put the plus jobs numfred 6 command on screen now in the game's launch options in Steam so that the game properly uses all 6 cores. There were some issues throughout, like brief hitches whenever you got to a checkpoint, and a slight amount of micro stuttering throughout the first mission, which wasn't actually that noticeable. I saw a slight slowdown in gameplay just outside of the airlock in the second mission again, which seems common for older processors. I'd thought as I was writing this actually, that maybe it was intentional as a side effect of there being lower gravity at that part, but as you'll see later on, the overclock actually fixes it. Overall, the game performs relatively great, but performance is near identical to the FX4300, showing that the extra two cores can only make up for the lower frequency, rather than help the FX6100 to surpass the lower core parts. Forza Horizon 5 actually performs pretty horribly, even worse than the 4300. Races, and the game itself for that matter, do load up a bit quicker with the 6100 thanks to the two extra cores, but that's pretty much the only positive over the lower end parts. Otherwise, the game could be noticeably micro stuttery to the point that it was actually often quite unpleasant to watch. The stuttering would become even more noticeable at points where the FPS would dip into the 40s and the 50s, and on one occasion it got pretty nasty for a few seconds. It's technically playable in the sense that you can play it, but it's not exactly going to be a pleasant experience. Overall, I'd say GT5 ran reasonably well. I used 1080p with everything on the lowest or normal settings, 
apart from anisotropic filtering which is at 16x and the variety sliders which I set to 50%. There was generally slight micro stuttering throughout which wasn't particularly noticeable or intrusive but it could be quite noticeable when driving in and around the desert area of the map. Elsewhere, such as when driving through the mountains, the game managed to run pretty smoothly, but that was the exception I think, as overall the game has a slight amount of micro stutter for the most part. It is all still playable though. This goes to show, along with Forza previously as well for that matter, that benchmark figures aren't everything, as looking at the figures for GT5, you'd think that it was reasonably smooth, but the more important figures are actually the frame times themselves. These are the amounts of time it takes for the next frame to be shown on your screen. So for example, you could be averaging 60 FPS constantly, but if the frame times are all over the place, it's going to be a stuttery mess. Lastly, before we talk about overclocking the 6100 and the quite surprising difference in performance it actually makes, especially compared to the quad-core FX chips, is Battlefield 5. Again, this is with the same settings as previously, so 1080p, lowest settings and DirectX 11. The game was generally still playable but had a noticeable but slight amount of micro stuttering throughout. This got very noticeable at points occasionally, although for the most part the stuttering stayed at a level that at least made the game still playable. Cutscenes were also stuttery and at one point the game froze for just under a second with the frame rate dipping into the 20s at that point too. A 60fps cap would probably help with the worst of the stutters, something I'll keep in mind for future tests. Now, overclocking the FX6100 was pretty disappointing to be honest. My particular one could only manage 4.22GHz and needed 1.512V to do so. 1.55V is what is considered to be the maximum safe voltage, but even that could make higher frequencies work. I've seen online other 6100s hitting much higher clocks at lower voltages, so I unfortunately just got a really bad overclocker. But as we'll see in the games, their performance increase is still massive. Cinebench R20 sees a 30% increase in score, from 729 points up to 951 points. Although power draw goes through the roof, up 71% to 144.17 watts plus minus 3%. It's pulling so much more power that the room where I do all of the benchmarks in actually got noticeably warmer. CSGO sees a huge improvement. We still see the noticeable hitching in the first round, although that is less severe than it was pre-overclock. Slight stuttering and brief hitches at points still happen, but are quite rare now, with performance generally being quite smooth. The 0.1% lows in particular, I think, are a representation of the hitches in the first round, so performance isn't actually as bad as that figure might make it out to be. Doom also sees a really big improvement. Almost all of the issues we saw pre-overclock are now much better. There is still a minor hitch and some light micro stutter occasionally, including the hitch when you get to the checkpoints, but other than that, the game runs really smoothly. And like I'd mentioned before, the slight slowdown in the battle just outside of the airlock in the second mission is now gone too. And another positive for the 6100 is that, unlike before, it now vastly outperforms the 4 core FX4300 as well. Forza Horizon 5 sees a massive improvement too. Things still aren't perfect, which I wasn't expecting to be honest, but overall the difference is huge. Stuttering is almost completely gone only happening on a couple of occasions throughout the test, and there are no horrible frame rate dips now either. The only things now are that races still take just as long to load as they did pre-overclock, and screen tearing is now quite visible at times, but that could be sorted by enabling VSync anyway. GT5 now ran far better as well. There could still be some slight micro stuttering throughout the city at night, but elsewhere the game ran pretty smooth now. Really the only places that could have issues were parts of the freeway that runs through the city. I saw some pretty bad stuttering there momentarily at one point, but other than that there were no other issues now. Battlefield 5 sees an improvement too, just not as big as the other games. Stuttering overall is much better now, but it can still get quite noticeable on occasion. Cutscenes are still stuttery, but the big hitch, along with the frame rate dip I saw during gameplay pre-overclock are gone now too. So I suppose in a way that the improvement is pretty big overall when you take that into account as well. <laughs>
again, I still think a 60 FPS cap would do the 6100 well here. So to conclude, while not exactly ideal, FX chips can still be quite useful for games today. The games I tested today had their problems, but they were at least still playable, although I'd definitely overclock the FX chip if you can though, as games like Forza Horizon 5 can be pretty unpleasant to watch. I'd also recommend a 60 FPS cap with a lot of games, as that would help with the worst of the stuttering that you'll see. That said though, if power draw is a concern for you, then I'd steer clear of them. Nearly 150 watts under full load for the overclocked 6100 is insane for the level of performance you get, and that would only have gotten worse if my 6100 was a decent overclocker. So to finish up, I'd like to say thanks to Shadow in the Void and Matt Asterak for their continued support, along with my other patrons on screen just now. I don't expect many to still be watching this part, as it's mainly to say thanks to my patrons, but if anyone else still is, thanks to you too for watching my video on AMD's FX6100. Hopefully you all found it interesting.